I'm here with Christine Carr. She is a nurse anesthetist in Alabama, and she is helping to fight against this Alabama medical marijuana bill, SB 46. I just wanted to have you come on and tell us what are your three main reasons for not liking this bill? Well, first, let's make a correction. It is not a medical bill. We do not say medical marijuana. We say marijuana dispensaries bill because it is not medicine. It does not meet the definition of medicine. It does not meet the kind of scientific rigor that is required to prove efficacy and safety in a product. Now, we do have FDA approved medicines that are marijuana synthetic, cannabinoid, purities. That's medicine. But what SB 46 is, is a marijuana dispensaries bill. It is a business proposal disguised as something medical. The number one reason for getting a card is for pain. And there's a lot of interesting, intriguing, and suggestive data in small studies that say, yeah, our natural endocannabinoid system, those receptors do play a role in regulating and, and decreasing pain on, on a short-term basis. But when you get out to large studies, where you have large populations, and when you get to using the kind of pharmaceutical grade materials, they do not pass real peer-reviewed uh, randomized controlled studies. Um, and they've, some of them gotten far and they've been, they failed in that phase three. So the misnomer, there's a misnomer that it is actually proven to help with pain. It is not proven. There is no evidence that it absolutely helps with pain, yet pain is the number one reason that people get it. And yeah. you see in states that have these dispensaries that the opioid use ends up going up and opioid related deaths end up going up. And over time, over a short period of time, then you start to see more heroin People that use marijuana are three times more likely to become addicted to heroin. You will see more fentanyl-related deaths, but marijuana is not proven to be something that, that helps with that. So we see, like Dr. Finn has said in his practice, people that are on this uh, dispensary marijuana, they end up wanting the opioids even more. So yes. it's, it's, I'm sorry it doesn't work, but... It doesn't work. And when we have people that come out and say, oh, it worked for me. I, it was wonderful. It was great. I'm, uh, that's great. I'm glad. And you're going to have um, every, for every person that says it was great, there's going to be someone else that says, no, it didn't work for me. And in fact, it actually hurt me. And, you know, you're going to have anecdotes on either side. That's why it's so important. If we're going to call anything medicine, you have to have evidence-based process with scientific rigor. And that's what's so sad about all of this is that when you see the cannabis industry, funding so-called research centers. They are dumbing down what we know to be scientific rigor. And they can have these terrible studies that have small populations, not well designed, yet someone can tag on that study and say, see, 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 we can use this now. No, we can't. This drug is a dangerous drug. It's always been a dangerous drug, especially because the potencies are so much higher today yeah. than they were in the past. And the potencies hurt the brain, especially the young brain. And that gets into my number two is why this bill is so bad. So number two um, is the increase in teen use. You can't escape it. No matter how nicely wrapped up they want to make this bill and say that we have all the safeguards in place. Kids aren't supposed to get it. You're not supposed to get it until you're 19. Well, you know, the prefrontal cortex doesn't really finish forming until maybe you're 25. And it's just unrealistic and naive to think that teenagers and children are not going to get their hands on these products. It's just going to happen. Um, it's happened in every state. And it, there is no doubt in anybody's mind, even the author of this bill knows, that children and teenagers consuming THC is catastrophic to the child, to their future, to their health. They'll be much more likely to develop psychoses, uh, have suicide attempts, a lifelong struggle with mental illness, much more likely to be on welfare, be unemployed, have trouble in life, have broken families. The list can go, go on and on. So that's my second reason is that the more you make something legal 
and have it available, it's going to get in the hands of teenagers. It's happened in every state and it's devastating. We will lose a generation, a generation of workforce. And so in fact, we not only need to stop this bill to prevent it from getting in the hands of teenagers, we need to do a much better job in Alabama of drug prevention in the first place because we already have teenagers on marijuana. We already have teenagers drinking alcohol and we're, and we're losing people. And we, we need to get more aggressive in fighting that and not make our problems harder by passing SB 46. Okay, what's your third reason? This is my third reason, or you can come up with another, is uh, I'm, I'm stepping back, I'm zooming out. The, the power of the drug cartels. You think that by legalizing you're going to decrease crime. And then it, hmm. it's counterintuitive to think that you're going to actually strengthen the drug cartels, but you do. We see this in every state that the drug cartels already have their business model set up. They can come in, they can set up their pot shots, they can take over, they know how to do the growing, they know how to evade the law, evade the rules. They have a lot of money in place. Their business model is already based on uh, uh, poly finance, poly drug systems on bullying and on bribery and on intimidation. And we've seen this take over entire countries that are allies of ours, but we are also seeing states in America become many narco states. And the drug cart cartels are there and they use the legalized marijuana as their channel to bring in the other illicit drugs. That's why you see the spike in Colorado in the fentanyl deaths on the streets and in the heroin. It follows, the illicit drugs follow the cannabis, the legalized cannabis. So not only do you have these drugs, more and more drugs coming in and more cartels taking over your communities, what are they doing with all that money? They're buying off your politicians, they're buying off your judges, they're buying off your governor. And if you think you're ever going to have a voice again on making sure that this so-called well put together cannabis commission is going to be fair or honest, I mean, I, I've got beachfront property in Arizona you can buy. Okay. So these are some of the ailments that you can have that would qualify you for yes. medical marijuana, anxiety or panic disorder, autism spectrum disorder, cancer related nausea and vomiting, weight loss and chronic pain, Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. epilepsy or a condition causing seizures, fibromyalgia, HIV AIDS, the nausea or weight loss part of that, menopause or premenstrual syndrome, mm -hmm. persistent nausea that is not mm -hmm. significantly responsive to traditional treatment, post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, there's a couple more on there. Are there any reasons that you would be okay with using cannabis for a patient? Not dispensary cannabis. When you have a pharmaceutical grade FDA approved drugs, and there are drugs already available for cancer patients and HIV patients, it's already there. We already have Epidiolex, which is a CBD, a pure CBD based medication that was fast tracked and approved by the FDA for certain, uh, seizure disorders, and they're researching it to see how they can expand the use of that, expand its label of use, which is great. We know the source, we know the potency, we already know the efficacy, we already know the parameters. And it's amazing too, these drugs, they, they have a very specific limit on the mil daily milligrams, like 20 milligrams a day. And these dispensaries, <laughs> I mean, I just cannot believe you, you could end up having, you know, you can have what 50 doses you can take home at a time. That's 3,500 milligrams of THC in your possession. When, when an FDA approved drug says don't take more than 20 in a day because you'll start to have psychoactive effects, you know, even with the, the pharmaceutical designed medications, there are risks. So having dispensary marijuana just ridiculous because you really can't prove uh the correct sourcing even though they say they can no one's been able to do that before all the audits done by other states have shown they can't keep up yes. with uh, those regulations and processes they it, it fails every time it's a fairy tale that they think they can do that there is absolutely no study showing 
that cannabis helps autism. All of the peer-reviewed, high-confidence studies show that it worsens autism scores. Any mother that consumes cannabis in pregnancy increases the likelihood that her child will have autism in life and psychosis starting at their age of 10. Increased chance. Even men who use cannabis alter their sperm and can pass on autism risk to their children. So if you care about autism, you should hate cannabis. Now, with muscle spasticity, there is some really good evidence of how cannabis can affect it's the basal ganglia in the brain and, and help with relaxing muscles. But when you see the data suggesting that it helps, it's always done with pharmaceutical grade cannabis. It's not done with dispensary cannabis. They say over and over again how dangerous it is, and they do not recommend using dispensary marijuana because of the drug interactions with the other medications these people are on. They're immunocompromised. They have other, they're on other medications that are liver toxic or cardiotoxic, and you mix this stuff in there, it can make them really, really sick. So they say yes to the thought of cannabis, but only pharmaceutical cannabis, not dispensary cannabis. Please, menstruating or PMS, if you're having difficulty with that, you're of childbearing years. No one of childbearing years should be on this just for risk of, of affecting your, your offspring. This gets to the business model of the dispensary. They need a wide berth of conditions because the addiction for profit industry needs customers. And they will find over time that keeping up all these lofty ideals of regulation and seat to sale is very expensive. And in order to keep up those standards, they're going to realize that the licensure fees for the dispensaries and the taxes they get off of the, the sale of the product is not gonna cut it. And then the cannabis industry is gonna to go to the commission and say, you know, we really need to help more people. So let's just open it up to more people, meaning they just need more customers. So the commission will be able to do that with very little oversight or say from the legislature. And that's how you tear it down brick by brick. And the Democratic Party in Alabama already said, hey, let's just open it up for everybody. Let's have recreational all the time. So, I, you know, people really need to wise up to what's happening and the, the potential disaster that it can be for our state. I want us to be able to be a state that pursues scientific rigor, evidence-based medicine. That is the most compassionate thing we can do for patients is to make sure we're accurate and we're knowledgeable and we're not succumbing to uh, political or financial pressures based on anecdotes. We, yeah. this, this drug is too dangerous to just play around. When it comes to marijuana, we have to stick with absolute hardcore evidence-based scientific rigor for everybody's safety and for the patient. I would love to see more trials like Carly's Law where they can have a tightly controlled study and have the research there. Like you said, it's, it's a researched base. Right. There are cannabinoids that are good that can work, but I agree with you, this bill is not gonna get us where we need to be. Fighting SB 46, this is the one that by killing it, we will save lives. We've gotta do it. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate your time.